speaking or commencing with uh, a reference to the bleakness of the days we're living through, with uh, the revival of uh, barbarity in the streets of Paris and the way in which these events are feeding into the worst instincts of the establishment here in France, in the rest of Europe, in the United States, in the Middle East. But even before the events in Paris, there was a veil of discontent that was descending upon our lands throughout Europe. Now, the, the, the question is, why is so little hope growing amidst so many riches? And make no mistake, Britain, Europe, are very rich countries. Ask the refugees who come in and take a look at our cities, at our highways, at our railways, even the ones in Britain. <laughs> I submit to you, friends and comrades, that hope requires the prospect of creative labor, creative work, an opportunity for people to actually unfold their talents while producing something worthwhile and in the process to create circumstances of security for themselves, their families, their communities, their nations, the world. But these creative jobs, the opportunity and possibility for creative work requires one thing, investment. And this is what John was referring to before. I'll just give you a number to add to a number that John has already given you. Uh, in the last three months in this country, around 76 billion was spent on all those things that help create wealth, like factories, manufacturing plants, roads, schools, machinery, all those things, land improvement, not land itself, but projects for improving land. All those things um, that create wealth and have a capacity to create new wealth, well, the investment in them in, the, in this country for the last three months was 76 billion, which sounds like a lot of money, until you realize that at the very same time, there is 743, this is my measurement, 743 billion sitting there gathering dust, doing absolutely nothing, idle cash. Now, the question, of course, is why is this happening? Don't the owners of these 743 billion want to put them to work? They do, but they are immobilized by fear that if they do invest in machinery that produces goods and services, then there won't be sufficient demand for those goods and services, and they will lose their money. And in a never-ending circle of reinforcement, the power of negative prophecy, they don't invest, the demand does not materialize, and then they see, say to themselves, see, we were right. This is a failure of the market mechanism to take the mountain of idle cash, to invest it into the productive capacities and means which will generate the incomes from which debts and deficits can be repaid. It's a failure of the machinery of financialized capitalism. It's very, very simple. So what we have in this country and in the rest of Europe we have savings far exceeding investment. Corporations, my estimate is that corporations themselves, they are sitting on about 450 billion out of the 740 something, about 400 and something billion are corporation savings. Now these savings far exceed investment. Now, it's a truth of algebra, a truth of mathematics, that if you've got Companies, corporations, saving more than they are investment, investing, so there is an excess cash mountain in the corporate world. Yeah? If the government balances its books, do you know what this means? That you can't. It means that somebody has to have a deficit. If the corporations save more than they spend in investment, and the government balances its budget, it means that the middle class and the working class will have to be in the red. So when austerity is being presented to you as a parsimonious project, as a project for tightening belts and not overspending, this violates, violates basic principles of logic. 
It would be possible for the government to balance its books and for you to balance your books if savings equal investment or investment equal savings. Osborne's project of eliminating the budget deficit means that the people of Britain will be condemned to go deeper and deeper into the red. And this is a message you have to take out there. So the primary imperative of a civilized Britain, and indeed a civilized Europe, is to lift investment up. Markets will not do it because they are caught up in that self-fulfilling negative prophecy. So that is where we need politics. It must be a political mechanism, just like the New Deal of Franklin Roosevelt, just like what happened in this country in the 1960s, just like it happened in Brazil with the result of elevating millions of people out of poverty. The only way that we can restore investment is, is through the political mechanisms that democratic, liberal democracies empower us with. But Mr. Osmond neither understands this nor is interested in it. This is where Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell and the rest of their comrades have a historic duty to this country, even to capital in Britain, to make it work. How do you do it? Well, allow me in the few minutes that I'm going to occupy you further, say in three ways, a three-pronged project. Firstly, you need to use the tax system to tax the hell out of retained earnings of corporations and give them tax breaks for investment. <laughs> Secondly, when this country faced an existentialist threat from the Nazis, the government put together Bletchley Park, and Alan Turing invented the computer. The best minds were put together, state-financed, and they were given a task. Now, we have a similar existentialist crisis. It's called climate change. It's called the environmental crisis. Why can't we have another Bletchley Park looking for ways of utilizing the resources and the intellectual resources of this nation and of Europe in order to create solutions to green energy which we don't have now? A Manhattan Project, the United States did it when they faced the prospect of a Nazi atom bomb. What did they do? They took the best minds, poured money on them, and the result of all that was what? The computer, the internet later on, and all those technologies that go inside our phones and allow neoliberals to celebrate the miracles of Apple and Microsoft. <laughs> and the third thing we need is an investment bank, a public investment bank, which issues bonds that do one thing. They mop up all this excess cash from the financial sector because the financial sector is interested in investing in good quality paper. So you create a public investment bank which issues bonds, borrows, in other words, from the private sector, from the corporations, and you have the Bank of England standing by in order to purchase those bonds in the secondary market to do a proper quantitative easing program which puts cash into investment at an arm's length from government without inflating house prices in the south of England. <laughs> Let me finish off on, with two points that take us beyond the realm of economics and finance. The first point has to do about with Europe. Because in the next 18 months, you are going to have to make a momentous decision in the context of the referendum. My message will be very brief. A labor-led Britain can lead Europe towards a Westminster model of democracy. Anything less than that, any attempt to escape from Europe will be futile and will simply strengthen both ultranationalism and the financial crisis which is afflicting the whole of Europe. You cannot escape Europe. You've got to help us democratize it.
And finally, I finish off with um, a message of solidarity to the people of Paris, but also to the people of Beirut, the people of Mali, the people of Damascus, all those who are suffering from violence, from terrorism, and from war. And it's a very simple one. And it's also comes in, it also comes in the form of a question. The thugs of ISIS, as they demonstrated in a number of places, Paris included, are prepared to die in order to close down mines and borders. Are we, the Democrats of Europe, prepared for the ultimate sacrifice to keep mines open and open borders? Thank you.